We looked at Dada artists and the artists of the new objectivity, along with the harsh views regarding World War I. However, there were artists in France that visually represented in their works feelings of nostalgia, hope, and at times despair. Artists in France were not experimenting as intensely as they were just a few years prior. Due to the war, their enthusiasm had dimmed and they were inclined to fall back into more traditional classical means of representation. There was a tendency toward classicism in the 1920s that was referred to as the order. The French, like many people throughout many of the countries that were involved in World War I, suffered loss and needed time to mend their wounds and recover from the horrors they experienced. Paris did remain to be a center for artists. One of the artists in Paris during this time was Medigliani. Medigliani was an Italian artist who, despite his sporadic illnesses, moved to Paris. He lived a bohemian lifestyle, making a living from drawings and portraits he made while at local cafes. Medigliani lived in Paris for 14 years until his death from tuberculosis. In January of 1920, Medigliani died in a local hospital. The next morning, his lover, Jean Huberturn, who bore him a child two years prior, committed suicide from jumping out of a window of her parents' home. His last 14 years while in Paris were spent on drugs, alcohol, and making art. Medigliani was a figurative artist and portraiturist. Medigliani rarely strayed from depicting a single person in his work. Most of his works were simplified with neutral backgrounds. Because he died so young at the age of around 36, there really is no way to see stylistic developments like we would in artists like Picasso, who lived a long life and had a very long career. His figures are securely integrated in the space, often in the interior of a room. Medigliani was friends with Picasso and would on occasion visit his studio, but he maintained his own visual style and was not influenced by cubism. Medigliani's portraits had elegantly long features. His work is often referred to as archaic art. He was able to capture the personalities of the portraits he did of his friends who were also well-known artists and critics of the day. Medigliani also painted children and art students. Basically anyone that would pose for him got painted. In this painting titled The Nude from 1917, we see a reclining nude. She is diagonally arranged in a small space. Her legs are cut off by the edge of the canvas. The figure is softly outlined. We can see the outline, but it is not distracting. So if we look, we're not seeing a thick, dark black outline. We are seeing outlines, especially along here in the face. But then if you look on the inner thigh on the outside of the leg, it's more of a darker brown or darker flesh tone. The soft flesh tones throughout the figure create volume and form. Medigliani liked to use white sheets and Venetian red fabric, and this can be found in many of his other paintings. It was assumed during that time that most of the viewers were male. By frequently painting the figure with a viewpoint from above, gave the viewer the perspective and implication that the model was sexually available. This gave his new paintings an exoticness to them, and with a depiction of pubic hair made the painting offensive and were often viewed as being indecent to the point that in 1917, during his first and only solo exhibition, the police removed all five of his nudes from the gallery. This next piece by Medigliani is titled Portrait of Jean Huberturn with Hat and Necklace. This was painted the same year he painted Nude, the previous image we just looked at. As mentioned, this is the person he had a relationship with, who had his child, then later committed suicide after his death. She was a 19-year-old art student when they met. She modeled for him often. He created more than 20 paintings of her, but never in the nude. Medigliani wanted to represent her as the idyllic modern woman. Here, we can clearly see his style of using outlines in the features of the face and the way in which he elongated the head, nose, and neck. 
Shame Saltine was the second youngest out of 11 children. He came from a poor Lithuanian Jewish family. Saltine had an interest in art from a young age. It wasn't until he was a bit older and started to spend time at the Beehive, which was an old tenement known as La Rouge, that he met several artists and began to create serious work. Chagall lived in there during that time, but it was Medigliani who took him under his wing and took him to the Louvre and showed him Italian paintings, and Medigliani worked with Saltine to improve his manners and his French. Saltine credited Medigliani for giving him confidence in himself. Saltine destroyed much of his work, and he also reworked his existing pieces, so it is difficult to see progress development from his early years to his more mature style. Saltine was influenced by various artists such as Rembrandt, Cezanne, Medigliani, and Van Gogh. Saltine's brush strokes are full of energy and intensity. His expressive brushwork appears to be uncontrolled. However, it's controlled enough to provide insightful de descriptions of the people and things he chose to paint. Red, blue, and white were popular colors for the artist to use, particularly during the 1920s. In this painting, Woman in Red, from 1924 to 1925, we see a figure sitting in an armchair. Looking at some details of this painting, we see her red dress poured onto the canvas, dominating the space. The red is picked up not only in a necklace, but also in her skin and a reddish brown background. The only part of the painting that stands out is the bluish black hat. Even though the figure sits still, the painting is very active through the use of color and brush strokes. At first, the portrait might seem like a harsh caricature through the distortions of her hands that appear arthritic and her distorted face, hat, and dress. But as we continue to look, it's realized that the person is highly individualized and has an ambiguous personality. We can see the subtle reference of a smile and a little glimmer in her eye. This woman in red can be viewed as slightly mad, intelligently shrewd, and a bit comical. We can almost see the influence of this may have had on de Koenig and other abstract expressionists of the 1950s. There is also a psychological complexity of this work, which may have influenced future surrealist artists. Marie Sutrilla was a painter whose father was an artist and whose mother was a model and artist. Maurice used the last name Trillo, which was a family name of an art critic who wanted to help him. No one really knows who his father was. It has been speculated that his father may have been an artist who his mother modeled for, possibly Chavon, Auguste Renoir, or possibly Edgar Degas. During his life, Utrillo suffered from bouts of alcoholism. Here we see a street scene from Montmartre. Utrillo painted many scenes throughout Montmartre. This painting is dominated by the street. Its sporadic brushstrokes in the foreground add texture and interest to the composition. It allows us, the viewers, to enter into the painting. The buildings on either side frame the scene. He places figures in the scene, but the real emphasis is the location itself the buildings, streets, and sidewalks. Utrillo is painting the character of the town. Towards the end of the war, Utrillo began to use brighter colors and incorporate more figures into his works. If you remember, the last time we talked about Henri Matisse was when we discussed his fall period. Matisse was not concerned with creating an illusion of depth on his canvases. Rather, he was more concerned with how he could relate objects in relation to each other through his use of color. Matisse was a bit older than many other of his fellow artists. He was in his mid-40s during World War I, so he did not participate in the war. 
Matisse and Picasso knew each other and through the course of many years created a bond through their cordial rivalry. If we look at Matisse's piano lesson from 1916, we can see how Matisse's interest in Cezanne's work could draw an appreciation of the Cubist work of Braque and Picasso. This painting is Matisse's most basic interpretation of Cubism made. Here, we see large planes of geometric shapes in greens and grays. There's a smaller pop of orange, which we can see right over here. So here's the green. And then here we see the pop of orange. And we also see the tabletop of the piano, which is painted in pink. The geometric planes destroy traditional viewpoints by single point perspective. For example, traditional artists would use one point perspective to create the window and balcony to recede back in space. However, Matisse creates a green plane to overlap the window and balcony and enter into the room where the boy is playing piano. So we see the, boy he the boy's head, the body's behind the piano, so he's playing the piano here. But this green overlaps the balcony railing in the balcony, so it's entering into the room. This very angular painting, with the only curves being the iron railing of the balcony, the music stand, and the piano and head and the figure in the lower corner, and there's a figure right here in the lower corner that we can see. Like many artists who were influenced by Cubism, Matisse fuses aspects of Cubism to suit his own style and techniques. Here's another painting with similar theme by Matisse just one year later. It's titled Music Lesson from 1917. This is in the artist's house in the same room as the painting we just looked at. This is more of a domestic setting. It's a pleasant painting. We see Matisse's two children basically grown up in the foreground here, and then Madame Matisse in the garden sewing. On the wall is one of his paintings, and in the garden, right here's his painting, and then in the garden, we see his sculpture reclining nude, Aurora. The same year this was painted in 1917, Matisse moved to Nice in south of France. There, he had a seaside studio. He continued to paint intimate scenes filled with sensual indulgence. He enjoyed using a variety of colors in ornate designs in rugs, tablecloths, and wallpaper. Matisse's work was much more relaxed than many of the other artists of this time. We will continue to see this in the next two paintings. This painting here is decorative figure against an ornamental background from 1925 to 1926. This is reminiscent of the Rococo style. Here we see the sculptural quality of the model that is surrounded around the many different patterns of, and fabrics. And the sculptural quality is really accentuated through the stiffness of this form, okay, of the, of the body, the figure is very stiff, and it adds to that sculptural quality. The back wall has a floral motif as if in a lush garden, and the Venetian mirror, which may be hard to see, but the Venetian mirror is right here, and this also provides a fancy sculptural feel. This painting here is interior with a phonograph. Again, shows his love for his window theme. So what we're looking at here is a phonograph over here, which is basically a very old version of a record player that plays vinyl records. And then we see the window in the back, and he does enjoy the window theme with many of his paintings during this time. Here he's displaying layers of rectangles to create his composition. We see a variety of colors nicely arranged throughout the rectangular openings. Overall, this is a very pleasant painting. If you look towards the center of the painting to your left, you will see Matisse's reflection in the mirror. And that is right here. Okay, here we are looking at Matisse's reflection in a mirror. Now, Matisse is actually sitting in front of the table with the fruit on it off the canvas. So he's 
off the bottom of the screen here and he's looking out this is in front of him and he's looking at and this is his reflection as he looks out by the 1920s matisse was in his mid 60s and enjoying paintings of pleasant scenes he began to reduce his figure again and simplify them as if he did in his earlier career here in Marion Dance Mural from 1932 to 1933, we see a large decorative triptych in the three lunettes for the Barnes Foundation in Marion County, Pennsylvania. This was commissioned by Albert Barnes, an American art collector. The Barnes Foundation has since been relocated to Philadelphia. To make this composition, Matisse had large sheets of paper with figures drawn on them, and he would move them and turn them to form his composition that he wanted and then he would remove the pieces of paper. Matisse used cutout papers for this painting mural only as an aid. In his later works, Matisse would infuse the cutout papers into his finished pieces. This mural shows his eternal love for simplified flowing figures. The arms and legs are tapered to almost a point. The colors are placed in wide linear bands of pink, purple, and black that contrast effectively against the light gray figures. The simplified use of imagery in the color allows the image to be viewed and understood from a distance. The design of the mural fuses perfectly with the architectural interior design of the room, which makes it one of the most successful murals of the 20th century. Another fall of painter who continued to paint as he aged was Raoul Dufy. This painting titled Indian Model in the Studio at Lampas Galma from 1928 shows that he still embraced his use of color. However, his colors here are a bit more reserved and like Matisse, Dufy painted scenes of the good life and an enjoyable life. Over the years, Picasso and Matisse shared a creative and at times a competitive rivalry. They both admired each other's works, talents, and ambitions. However, Picasso's work was very different from Matisse's, who wanted to paint harmoniously without the intrusion of conflict. Picasso, on the other hand, embraced transition and conflict. Picasso allowed himself and his work to transform and change. Picasso is quoted as saying, I paint objects as I think them, not as I see them. Many European avant-garde movements, along with Cubism, lost momentum starting around 1914. Writers and artists such as Braque, Legis, and Alpiniere enlisted in their armed forces to serve in the war. Picasso did not participate in the war. Instead, he moved to Paris and continued to paint. During the next couple of years, Picasso began creating portraits of important friends, critics, and modern art dealers. This is a pencil drawing done by Picasso of Ambrose Villard from 1915. Villard was Picasso's dealer. Picasso was a smart businessman and understood the importance of working with art dealers and keeping them happy to ensure more commissions and sales of his work. This is a realistic and beautifully rendered drawing. Just as beautifully rendered as Picasso's drawing that we just looked at in a previous image is Olga seated in an armchair from 1917. Olga Kloklova was a young dancer who he met while working on the parade in Rome. Picasso soon married Olga and she quickly became the subject for many of his portraits. This painting is considered unfinished, but it shows that there was an interest and resurgence in the classical style during this time. Picasso was an extremely versatile artist that could work in different styles simultaneously. The same year he painted Olga seated in an armchair, he also created The American Manager. The parade was a new ballet that Picasso, along with a few other artists, were hired to help create costumes in the set designs. The parade was a celebration of sideshow performances. The parade's theme was of the conflict of commercialized mechanics deafening noise of sound effects. 
and the delicate harmony and humanity through music and dancers. This figure of the American manager was a costume Picasso designed for the ballet, representing the deafening noise and sound effects. The parade contained many of the same elements that the Zurich Dadaists were exploring. The parade was first performed in Paris in 1917 to a largely outraged bourgeois audience, and the parade became a success du scandale. This project renewed Picasso's interest in the characters from the Italian Commedia dell'Arte, along with descendants from the French circus. Just after the war, Picasso continued to experiment with cubism and different forms of representation and classicism. In this painting by Picasso, The Pipes of Pan from 1923, we see the figures placed in a simple setting reminiscent of 5th century Athens. There are two young athletic men gracefully posed, yet having great mass at the same time. The simple structures and solid blues flatten the background, depriving the painting of any spatial recession, thus giving this painting more of a stage setting. This next painting by Picasso is Three Musicians from 1921. This is in a style of synthetic cubism, which is cubism created with vibrant colors. These three figures are a disguised version of portraits of Picasso and his two lost friends. Picasso portrays himself as the middle figure. He is the Harlequin with the checkered outfit, something Picasso has been known to do in many of his works. And we could see that right here, he's holding the guitar. Now to our left, playing the flute, is Alpenier, the writer poet who two years after being wounded in World War I, died in the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 at the young age of 38. And on our right in the dark monk robe holding the musical notes represents Max Jacob right here, who at that time recently joined the monastery and withdrew from the world. This painting acts as a memorial to his two friends who are no longer part of his life. Garnica was a town in Spain that was bombed in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War, not World War I, which ended in 1917. It was a sudden coordinated attack that the Germans would reuse during World War II in their attacks against England. The attack lasted three hours. The target was a bridge. However, the main part of the town of Garnica, about 15 blocks, was completely leveled. About three-fourths of the town's homes were destroyed, and many townspeople had died during this attack. A day after the attack, Picasso heard about this in Paris and was compelled to create sketches about it. He soon created a large painting over 11 and a half feet by 25 and a half feet. It was done in black, white, and grays to create the feeling of urgency that one would experience if looking at a newspaper article and photos from a newspaper. This painting depicts helplessness, suffering, violence, and death. The bull, which we can see over here, represents the presence of death. The bull is a symbol often used in Spain, and it is also as used as a classical myth reference to the Minotaur. The horse, right here, is struck with a spear, and you can see the pain and anguish in the horse's expression, which is also expressed in the woman to our left as she holds her in her arms a baby that is now dead, her dead child. So you can see the, the death in the face and the anguish in the woman's face here. And all the way to our right over here, there's a woman screaming up at the sky as her house burns, and you can see the window of her house and the flames up here. On the bottom of the painting is a picador, the antagonist of the bull, the one who chases him with a lance on horseback. He also represents dead soldiers. The surrealist 
must use the bull to represent an irrational force of the human psyche. The Guernica painting was sent on tour to help raise money for the Republican cause. This painting symbolizes the fight against totalitarianism and the horrors of war. We are going to move on now to Picasso's close friend, George Brock. In 1914, Picasso and Brock did not work as closely as they did during experimental time developing Cubism. Brock joined the military during World War I and was seriously wounded in battle. After his recovery, he returned to Paris in 1917. Picasso was in Italy during this time working for the Parade Ballet, and due to the war, many other artists were now in other areas scattered either throughout France or in other countries. During this time, Brock continued to paint in synthetic cubism, but with a slightly different approach. This painting by Brock titled Café Bar from 1919 is an example of what Brock would create for the following 20 years of his life. This is a narrow and tall painting. In this painting, we see a pipe, guitar, a journal, or music notes, along with other various objects. They are vertically placed onto a small marble table. The main difference between the works of Picasso and Brock is that Picasso was more experimental and Brock's work was intense and conservative. Brock tended to stay more focused on cubism throughout his career. This next painting by Barack is called Woman with Mandolin from 1937. We see a broader use of different colors with the incorporation of yellows and oranges. An environment is now being created. Here we see a slender, long, seated female with a musical stand with notes in front of her as she plays the mandolin. We see different patterns on the walls behind her. The woman, due to her darkness, seems to become more of a shadow in comparison to the colored objects and walls that are around her. Bernard Leger was an artist who served in World War I. Afterwards, he created a depersonalized style, as we can see in this painting titled Three Women from 1921. The figures are stiff and uniformly painted. They stare unemotionally at the viewers. This is the largest of three other similar versions with the same composition. Leger referred to his subjects as eternal and timeless. He was influ influenced by Jacques-Louis David, Angre, Renoir, and George Seurat. Even though this painting of three women was classically inspired, it is without a doubt completely modern. Here we see forms and objects abstracted into geometric shapes in such a manner that shows that he may have been aware of artists like Mondrian, who was also living in Paris during this time. The painting has an art deco quality. Leger explored contemporary industrial society as its placement with humanity. We also see this in his painting, The Great Parade from 1954. It's a much larger painting where he outlines his figures and objects in black using basic transparent colors that create floating shapes. Here we see Leger's love of the circus. This is a 19 by 13 foot canvas that took him two years to complete. Leger continued to explore his theme of humanity and machines while keeping aspects of cubism throughout his work. Amade Ozenfan and Le Corbusier, whose real name was Genere, were two artists who developed purism, which was a variant of cubism in 1918. The two published their theories and ideas in their manifesto titled After Cubism. These two artists, Le Cubuset and Ozenfan, accused and ridiculed the current state of cubism for turning into nothing more than a form of elaborate decoration. The two artists painted their objects in a way that appeared to have more architectural structure. They symbolized the machine as pure and functional which is what they wanted for their paintings. 
Their objects are simplified and solid. We are still seeing different angles in one view, but it is not broken and dispersed throughout the canvas. Instead, it is given weight and firmly placed in the intended locations on the canvas. Both paintings, Guitar and Bottle, which is the bottom image by Ozenfant, and Still Life, which is at the top by Le Corbusier, arrange their objects so the viewer can see the frontal view. Their colors are toned down and their objects have volume to them. There is a clean, simplified appearance to their work that is symbolic of the purity that is like a well-maintained brand new machine. All the parts smoothly working together.